imagine you enter a dimly lit room. Well, I guess you don't really have to imagine that, right? We're all in one right now. <laughs> but then imagine that it's not some guy in golf pants with a suit jacket on for no reason with a very awkward outfit in front of you. Imagine there's a child on a piano and a hush falls over the crowd because you're trying to hear what this child has to play. You're waiting for twinkle, twinkle, little star, or maybe now I know my ABCs. But that's not what you hear. You hear the cascading keys of a near virtuoso. Maybe a little Mozart, maybe a little Art Tatum, some Charlie Parker, some Coltrane. The child moves over the keys in an unexpected manner because you expected what you expected. But this child is different. It's not like other children. It's not in the beginning. It gets it. If you put this child anywhere else, it would do the same thing. If you put it in poetry, it could recite to you Langston Hughes. It could tell you what a dream deferred is. It could recite my Angelo. It could recite the greats. It could mimic and mirror the greats in science, math, just, just all over the board, right? It does things that we wish we could do. And so we're watching this future child say, whoa, if I was like that, I would have dressed better and picked better pants because the child probably has better fashion sense, right? But we're not like that. But this child is. But you notice something peculiar about this child. Something different. When you clap, the child doesn't respond to your performative, you did great. When you criticize, the child doesn't care, doesn't respond either. It just performs. This child just, it just performs. It can perform at high levels, but it doesn't care about your praise. And it does not care about your criticism. So then you have to ask yourself some questions. Who is our child? What is our child? Is something wrong? Why doesn't our child recognize the typical social cues and react like the rest of us would? Why, if my, our child could get right here Recite what I'm reciting with no nervousness. But maybe you don't feel it as much. Why isn't our child scared? Why doesn't our child care? Why can't we quite feel? Where's the empathy? You don't see the warmth in this child's laughter. You don't see the fear in this child's eyes. You see nothing of this sort. So you start to panic. Is our child a sociopath? Is our child a, a psychopath? Well, on our way to sleep at 9 or 10 p.m., when we put our favorite crime shows on, our child pops up, and we go, oh, yikes. <laughs> Didn't do well with that one. Who and what is our child? Well, what brought me to thinking about these things was raising three sons myself. I started to think, how do you prepare a child prodigy or just a child period? And my sons are adults, 20, 19, and 18. And so I always question, did I prepare them the way they were supposed to be prepared? I questioned it even more a year ago when my uh, middle son, who's on the autism spectrum, low functioning, low verbal, was graduating from high school. It was an awesome day, one of the, probably one of the most pinnacle days of my life. Well, my oldest son would say, well, what about my graduation? So he'll fuss at me later for that one, right? But it was, it was a high esteem pinnacle. Our entire family was there. We had so many plans, so many plans. We watched the graduation. We planned to go to dinner. We planned to visit family. We planned to take them around on like a parade, like, like we were the Los Angeles Lakers and we had won the championship. But I got tired throughout the day. And so I just went home. <laughs> Reality is we went home. I said, I'm gonna get some sleep. That was an exciting day. It was excellent. But somewhere around three in the morning, wake up to use the restroom, and something felt different. All of a sudden, couldn't feel my left hand, couldn't feel my left leg. Apparently, I was having a stroke, or as I like to call it, a minor brain bleed, but there's probably no such thing as a minor brain bleed. So in that ambulance for those five minutes, I was like, man, are any of my sons prepared for what's happening right now or what could happen?
tomorrow or in the next hour. And for the next five days, when family would come by, when my wife sat in the hospital with me, when my mother sat in the hospital and, and made sure she asked a million questions to scare the nurses and the doctors and say, hey, that's my baby. He's got to come home. I just kept thinking, are my sons prepared for me not to be here? Would it be easier if they were prodigies? Maybe. I mean, if it's the prodigy that we're describing, right? This prodigy does all its homework on time, knows all of its math, all of its English, knows everything, does what it's supposed to do. It doesn't, doesn't lie to you, shows up on time to school. When it says, hey, I'm with John or Mike, it actually is with John or Mike. When you say, be back at 10 or 11, the prodigy is there at 10 or 11. It doesn't go outside the parameters. And that could sound very good to parents. It sounds like right now as I describe it, I'm like, wait a minute. I should meet this prodigy. <laughs> but the thing is, we miss moments like that. Like the moment when your son or your daughter comes to you and says, hey, dad, I really like her. Can you help me buy a Valentine's Day gift? And you go, oh, and they go, no, don't do that. <laughs> or the moment where they say, I'm tired. I couldn't take it on the bus. I couldn't take it anymore. I let the bully have it. And by the way, you have to come to school tomorrow and talk to my principal. Rough moments, but beautiful, challenging moments. But our prodigy, won't have any of those moments themselves. And as parents of this prodigy, we won't have those moments either. And that's unfortunate. There's no epiphany for our prodigy. There's no spiritual awakening for our prodigy. There's no, aha. And everybody in this room has had an aha. And it felt so good when you had it. But our prodigy doesn't get that opportunity. I, mean, I guess now that we kind of understand, or there's probably people in the room who understand parenting much more than I do, for sure. Grandparenting and everything. I'm still learning. Or maybe I'm taking a vacation since these kids are grown. I don't know. I have to reveal a truth to you all. A prodigy is of us, but not like us. Our prodigy was decided not by any of us in this room, but we carry it. And it was a long and uh, rough birth, as my wife Jocelyn, who's a doula, student midwife would say, a rough birth. But it's here, we came to term, it's here now. <laughs> so we have to deal with it. It's of us, but not us. Our prodigy is artificial intelligence. That's our prodigy's full name. And like good uncles and aunts, grandparents right here in the village, we don't give it a nickname, which we already have. AI, right? Or maybe little AI. I like little AI. Still little, because still a toddler. Very smart, just a smart toddler. Little AI, much better than man man. At least I think, that's what they used to call me. Little AI, what do we do with our wayward child that doesn't feel in the way we feel, doesn't smile the way we smile, doesn't feel the warmth in the way that we feel the warmth. It's going to grow. It's growing now. It's growing at a rapid rate. Well, what we've already done is what we always do with prodigies. Every camp, every job, everything that it asks us, we send it to those camps. Lou AI said, can you send me to health care? We said, absolutely. We don't want to hinder our prodigy's growth. Lou AI said, can you send us to education? Absolutely. We don't want to hinder our prodigy's growth. Lou AI said, can you send me to health insurance? And then Lou AI said, you know what? I want to serve my country. Can you send me to war? Can you send me to the military? And we said, that's a, that's a valuable experience, Lou AI. It's a valuable experience. Now, the problem with this is the same problem that we would have if it was any other child. You give it everything but it does not have 
comprehension or quite the common sense yet or what we consider common sense amongst us yet. It just doesn't happen. I mean, Lily, I can tell you Tupac is awesome and recite Dear Bama lyrics and talk about Afeni Shakur, but Lou A.I. doesn't understand why Afeni Shakur was so dear to Tupac Shakur, because Lou A.I. can't feel that. It's just not a feeling that Lou A.I. gets to feel. The question becomes, what do we do about it? And why should we do something about it? Well, a lot of reasons. The studies show us that when Lou A.I. is in healthcare, Lou A.I. may decide that you don't need the pain medicine that you need because a woman's pain threshold is higher than a man's. So somewhere on the screen, somebody makes that decision because that's what little AI said. We trust our prodigy. Little AI says, well, these section of kids and these section of kids should be taught differently because they're in different demographics, with different tools. Because that's the guess that little AI makes based on the numbers and the information. There's no nuance to little AI. Little AI doesn't have nuance. Doesn't have that warmth. That's our responsibility. And even more dangerous, we sent Lou AI to the military. How dangerous is our prodigy when we invite it into the kill chain? Lou AI sometimes doesn't know the difference between a military base or a school building. It may not know the difference between a post, a military post, our medical office. And we sent it to the military purposely because that's where it was made, right? It was made on college campuses. It was made in the military, like all of our great technology. And we are, make no doubt about it, awesome. The best at it. I say that as a veteran. We are the best at it. So why wouldn't we put little AI amongst our greatest minds? But when you put AI in the kill chain, the plane is going at Mach 3. And Lou A.I. is just a little bit wrong. Lou A.I. doesn't take the second chance to think, that's just somebody's daughter. That's just a wedding party, not a group of terrorists. Lou A.I. doesn't say, maybe I shouldn't charge this much for insurance. Lou A.I. says, the numbers tell me this is what makes my company money. That's what Lou A.I. does. Does not have that warmth. Well, we are to pivotal moment, right? A pivotal moment. As parents, co-parents, baby daddies, baby mamas, whatever words you like, husband, wives, intact, however you like it, that's where we are and we're responsible for what little AI does. We have to raise little AI with ethics. But we also have to model ethics. Interesting fact, and this may be off, but it may not be off. I love sports, and we keep saying AI, and it just came to me. I just remembered. You know, Allen Iverson's nickname is AI, and ironically, his nickname in the league was The Answer. And we're starting to look at our little AI as the answer. But the truth is, we're the answer. Little AI is not the answer yet. We're responsible for modeling proper ethics so that the right data gets into Lou AI so that when AI is making decisions, it makes decisions with the smiles I see out here, with the warmth I see out here, human decisions. The stylistic said it best. No matter how many machines you make, right? People make the world go round. So let's not just leave AI on his own. How's he supposed to learn? Would it be his fault if he did us damage later? I mean, what happens if I have the next stroke? Will AI be capable of giving my doctors the information needed to help me? Or will AI cut my insurance? Because that's what makes companies money. We have to figure those things out. It's on us. We have to raise AI, assuming that in the future, AI will have to take care of us. Happy co-parenting. Thank you.